Thank you very much for being here tonight. Once again, it is a privilege and an honor to have the opportunity to preach the gospel before you and hope I think I hope the things I say here tonight will be encouraging and edifying to you. And it means a lot for you to be here tonight. And I wouldn't feel right if I didn't say a few things before I got started here. It's great to see the Kazmerskis. And, uh, you know, Sarah came to our little congregation at Westside. And I was so worried for a while that Sarah wouldn't like us because we took her to dinner with us after services one time. And, and me and the boys were there, and we were just bickering about everything and everything under the sun. She goes, no, it feels like home. <laughs> and I thought, well, you'll fit in just fine here then. And, uh, you know, I just uh, really thank the world of Sarah, and uh, I wish nothing but the best for you and your family, and I thank you so much for being here. I would also feel foolish not to mention the halls here as well, Greg and Kayla Ruth, uh, for being here. Their mom was my biggest supporter when it came to gospel meetings, and, and we spent the afternoon talking about some of the individuals that it just fathomed me uh, how they've went to every place I've went. And there's two people that always come to mind when I think of what I've preached gospel means, and they were there. One was an individual by the name of Don Kimball. He was over at uh, Cedar Avenue, and he was a supporter of my gospel means. But Cynthia, not only went to my gospel means, but any time I preached somewhere and I asked her to go with me, she went with me. And uh, and her, we just celebrated her birthday just a couple of days ago, and I said, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about her. And uh, so I greatly appreciate you guys being here today. And uh, so I hope that the things I'll say here will, will benefit you. And I hope that we can be built up here, not only tonight, but we can be built up throughout the week. And, and what I want to talk about here tonight is bearing your talent. And there's a reason poor Corey had to read all that scripture there. And, and I, want, I want us to understand kind of the kind of the process here when it comes to burying our talent. Because when we think about the five and the two and the one, and, and, and we think about this one talent this individual have, and we think that this one individual that has this one talent, it could be a talent of silver, it could be a talent of a variety of things, and we, think, we say to ourselves, we are that one talent kind of individual. We say we only have one ability, we have one gift, and we have one way of doing things, and that should be because he specifically described this in his parable. But keep in mind, too, a couple of things. One, when it comes to a talent, it's no different than maybe a dollar or maybe a couple dollars. And when we take one dollar away, say five dollars, we don't say we have, uh, we don't have any dollars, we say we still have money, right? That's the same way we should look at talents. It's not just one ability. It's not one gift, and it's not one way of doing things. It is a variety of things that we can do with the abilities that we have. And remember, abilities is in a plural form. Another thing, too, if you keep in mind, when he is told that he is a wicked and lazy servant, he gives him options of what he could have done with it. He doesn't give him one. He gives him more than one. And I think when we look at the talents, we really got to examine ourselves, not to say that we have one sole ability and we could all rely on this one sole ability that we have. We need to ask ourselves, what more can we do when it comes to the things concerning the Lord's work? No, brethren, you don't have to be an individual that stands in the pulpit. And no, brother and sister, you don't have to have some... Uh, as, strong voice or some powerful voice to sing along. And no, you don't have to be able to lead the most eloquent prayer or be able to teach a class. There is a variety of things that we do that we sell ourselves short because we think that our talents only involve what's in the building. And it's not. What I want us to look at here tonight, when we think about our talents, maybe we need to look at the aspects of our talents instead of just looking at the one thing that we can do. And instead of asking ourselves, what's the one thing we can do, maybe it's the things that we need to get rid of out of ourselves to carry on what God wants us to do as individuals. That's what I want us to look at tonight. That's what I want us to examine ourselves with. Not sit back and say, here's what I can do. I can, I can preach, I can teach, I can lead songs, and I can lead a prayer. No, brother, I don't want you to do that. I want to ask, what can you remove from you to say, what else can I do? 
you know, there's a thing that coaches will say about how when we are individuals that are lazy, we'll say we ask ourselves why we fail. But when an individual is not lazy, he asks themselves, what more could I have done? There's a difference. And may I encourage us as individuals, and brethren, we're all different. And we all have different abilities, and we're all different ages, and, and male and female, and we have different jobs, and we have different roles in life. But it does not excuse ourselves to do more. And it should not excuse ourselves to do more. And one of the things I want us to look at first and foremost here tonight is, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know I did that. Uh, what? I bet you P Peyton did a sermon, didn't he? Okay, I'm going to blame Peyton because I didn't do that. He's the one that does all the little pretty PowerPoint stuff. One of the things I want us to look at here tonight is the idea of laziness. Look there in Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25, where the Apostle Paul says, Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing not that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respects of persons. And he tells us when we do this for the Lord, do it heartily. And if you have various translations, it tells us a very powerful message. One says, do the best you can in the easy to read. One says, do as best as you can in the, in the English standard. And what it's trying to bring here is what we need to do. We need to do it the best that we can. And you want to do the best that you can. Maybe you had something to eat today. And I'm not talking about the Marshalls. I enjoyed eating at the Marshalls. But maybe if you go to your favorite restaurant, let's put it that way. That way we save trouble. <laughs> well, let's say you go to a restaurant, and you go there, and it's not the same food that you had last time you were there. Maybe the fries weren't done the way you had them last time. Maybe the, the, the hamburger you got at McDonald's wasn't as good as the last one. Maybe you just noticed something different, and you become disappointed at it, and you become critical of that. Or you think about maybe you go and you go, uh, you go get something at Lowe's or you get something at Home Depot or you go get something at Walmart and maybe the service is not the greatest and you become very critical of that. Harold wouldn't stop telling me how great Aaron Rodgers was doing this afternoon. I that. But you think about how critical we are when it comes to a variety of things. You know, the thing that Nathan said in his prayer today, he got that from, from a guy that, uh, that officiated a sport. And he says, of these negative thoughts that we have, was it 50,000? And says 40,000 of those are negative. And you think about how critical we are when it comes to the things of this world. Why are we not critical of ourselves when it comes to the work of the Lord? There's many times I've come off to the pulpit and I ask my wife, is there something I could have done better? Did I do that right? And she's usually my best critic. Because, brother, if I don't bring 100% to you as a preacher, I'm not doing my job. I really am not. If any individual comes up here and he can't do this work heartily, you don't need him as a preacher. <laughs> Because this is a privilege. And we need to be back in that kind of mindset when we come and we evangelize Christ and Him crucified. And if we believe in it like we say we believe in it, we should be doing it heartily. When I go out that door and I go and I meet with people and I meet with friends and I meet with family and I meet with loved ones and I meet with coworkers and I want to show this example. Jesus Christ to them, I should be able to do that heartily too. And brethren, don't tell me that even in little old Wellsburg, West Virginia, that we don't have anything really to do here. And many times I've heard individuals say that we have done this before and it has not worked, so therefore we don't do it anymore. 
We've done this before and it has not worked and therefore we don't try to do this anymore. I went to one sp specific organization where they wanted some kind of spark into their organization. And I said, well, let's try a few things. And I give them about five things to do. And they said, no, we're not going to do that because we've done that before and it hasn't worked. So therefore, we're not going to do it anymore. And unfortunately, they suffered for it. And it's because you are already negative from the get-go. You've already had it set in your mind because past have been done and they have not been successful. Therefore, let's not do it. And you never put in something else that we could do. You just say, this doesn't work. We're not doing it. But you don't put in it's what can work then. Sometimes when we become so critical of ourselves, we don't really think about, well, what will work? Or we may not, and we may not, or we'll try again, and maybe we'll be surprised with the results. I had one guy that I, I preached at a little congregation over in Ohio, and I had a gospel meeting there, and I remember this guy came in, and he brought this little guy that looked like Santa Claus, and he went on a really severe diet. And he came in, he sat down, I got to meet him, and I remember the guy come up to me, he goes, you know, I invited him tonight. And the next thing he said was this, because if he said no, what would I have lost? I am encouraged that you took the opportunities to take your cards and send them to people, give them to people. Because what are they going to do? They'll probably throw it away. But look, you made somewhat of an effort. And sometimes we think because it's a small effort, we disregard that it's an effort at all. You know what really helped me in a congregation such as Payton City? That was my first congregation I went to as a member. What really helped me spiritually as a member of that congregation is it was my birthday and I was 25, 26 at the time. I was living by myself, I had an apartment and when I came home, usually at that age, you, you really ex just, just expect bills. <laughs> but here it is, well there was, there's bills and flyers, and, but here's a card. And I have no idea who it is. And I told Tracy, I said, would you please, uh, can you tell me who this is? And, and the husband's name was Lawrence Heasley. And she said, and I said, where do they sit at? <laughs> That's how I know people. Tell me where they sit at at the church. She says, they sit in the back, in the very back row to the left. So after service, or one service, I went up there. I said, thank you so much for sending me a card. Well, his wife, a couple months later, she ends up in a bad situation, and she ends up passing away shortly afterward. I said, you know, that was the same lady that gave me this card. Let's go visit her in the hospital. We took her flowers. And you thought that I just saved her from dying. And it was just a small token. And they thought the world that I just took this time out of my, and it wasn't really a busy life, but just to go up there in New Martinsville and spend time with her. It's just small things, brethren. And sometimes... When we do these things, we do them heartily, it gives great results, but that card just started everything. It probably didn't cost more than probably a buck 25. And sometimes we think that in order to try to overcome the things of worldliness or try to promote the gospel, we got to spend a lot of money, we got to get a lot of people involved, and we got to try to do something big in order to bring people in. No, you don't. Sometimes it starts with small things, and it starts with ordinary people. Brethren, by all means, tell me who was the scribe or who was the Pharisee when Jesus appointed those apostles. There was only one, and he came later. <laughs> tell me what kind of individuals were they? Were they that knowledgeable in the law? Were they that, uh, uh, they were imperfect or perfect human beings that came and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ? No, they weren't. They were average people just like you and I. 
What was Jesus trying to bring? What kind of message was Jesus trying to bring when he brings ordinary people to promote this message? Why would he bring a tax collector? Why would he bring a zealot? Why would he bring fishermen? Why would he bring brothers and, and, and family members involved in this? Because they're average people. And brethren, sometimes in order to promote the gospel, that's exactly what we need. We don't need eloquent speakers. We don't need great individuals. We don't need people that likes to announce their names when they walk through the door. We just need regular people. Because in the world's eyes, it doesn't matter. But in God's eyes, it's fantastic. Don't sell yourself short. And don't think that you're, you are something insignificant. If that's the case, then Christ's sacrifice was pointless. Because we need ordinary people. When you look at another passage here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, he says, every time you find work to do, do it the best you can. He says, in the grave... There is no work. There is no, no thinking, no knowledge. There is no wisdom. And we're all going to the place of death. We just sang a song that was done by a lady named Fanny Crosby. Take some time to check her out. Because Fanny Crosby has wrote a lot of songs and a lot of hymnals. And you may think that she is some individual that's had some glamorous life. She hasn't. <laughs> her husband left her. After they find out the baby has passed away, she ends up becoming blind. And one of the points I find interesting about old Fanny Crosby is they ask her at the age, I think, of 94, when she's still doing the things that they're doing, say, Fanny, when are you going to stop? Fanny said, when I'm cold and dead in the grave at 94. Brethren, there will be a time for complete rest. And we're assured of that in the scriptures. But be mindful of Jesus Christ and his initiative while he carries on his ministry of the urgency that he had at some times, especially after he risen from the grave. Let's keep in mind that while we still got two legs and while we got a beating heart and breath in our lungs, there is stuff that we can do. Do not wait for the day when you cannot walk or you cannot get up out of your bed or, get, or be able to get out of your house and say, boy, I wish I could do this now. Take the opportunity now while you still have it because there is a lot of work that we can do. Think about this too. Think about sometimes when we do the neglect. Look there, whoops, I'm sorry. Look at Luke chapter 16, verses 27 through 28. When we see here the rich man Lazarus, and we see that there is some urgency now with this rich man. And we just talked about this Wednesday night in our Bible study about how Last, or the rich man is in this place of peril now, and he understands that he can't get out. And now he is begging for Lazarus to do something for him. And he says, please, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house on earth. I have five brothers, and he could warn my brothers so that they would not come to this place of pain. And how has that responded? You've had opportunity. And it doesn't matter what I send back, they're not going to listen. How tragic is it that we see children that have grown up in a church and they have left the church as soon as they've graduated from high school? Or maybe they go off to college and they go to a congregation and maybe that congregation doesn't really talk to them or spend any time with them. Or how tragic is it when somebody has stumbled and we don't do anything to encourage them and lift them back up? 
Don't neglect what we have amongst us. Don't wait for four weeks that a brother and sister in Christ has not been here and say, I wonder where they've been. You think about the communication that we have today. I still have a house phone. And I have a cell phone. And we got email. And we got Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. And I can go on. <laughs> We have all these opportunities to make communication, text messaging. How often do you use that to build someone up in the gospel? And you'll probably tell somebody how bad they are in fantasy football. You'll probably tell them about, you know, Something that's happened this week. You know, I brought this up one time at one of my congregations that I work with. You think about how many times the like button is used on social media, on Facebook. Let's just say Facebook in particular. When somebody has a birthday, you want to let them know to have a happy birthday. And there's usually a like button for that. If somebody has an anniversary, you usually tell them happy anniversary. You'll put a like on that too. If somebody has had something fantastic happened in their life. They, they got a new job. They, they're going to go somewhere far away and they're going to start a new life. And then you'll let them know, congrats, put a like on it. Someone passes away, you'll express your condolences. You think about some of the personal things that we get that go on in our life and we have no problem whatsoever talking about that. You might see someone's cute dog, and you want to put a like on that. You want to see somebody wear a new dress, you'll put a like on that. But when it comes to putting the message of the gospel on social media, how often do you put a like on that? When somebody tells you that they're going through some kind of personal, uh, spiritual struggle, and they're fighting and they're winning, how often do you put a like on that? When some temptation that comes along with an individual and they are struggling with it and they say, I need prayers, how often do you put a like on that? I'm not telling you to stop celebrating birthdays and anniversaries and things of that nature, but man, when someone's out there trying to put out the gospel, we as Christians should be able to like stuff like that. And someone's not afraid to talk about it. I have a lady that has overcome drug addiction. And all she talks about now is Jesus Christ. And she put this video and and she talked there for 10 minutes. And the the message within her message is, you got to put your faith in Christ. I said, this is awesome. I want you not to stop talking about this. I don't want you to be embarrassed to talk about this. You may have 50 friends that may think you're just some narrow-minded, naive individual that know nothing because you followed along in Christ. Don't be ashamed of that. The Apostle Paul reminds us, don't be ashamed of these things. Don't neglect the gift that is in you. Don't neglect these things that we have when it comes to our talent. Look there in Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15. The people brought little children to Jesus so they could lay his hands on them to bless them and to pray for him. It says, when the followers saw this, they told the people, stop bringing children to him. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them because God's kingdom belongs to the people who are like these children. After blessed the, uh, after Jesus blessed the children, he left there. And, and, and I want us to be mindful. Let's not be a situation of individuals that just wants to ignore uh, that thinks that we need to focus on just one particular group. Uh, uh, let me get my point here with Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. 
or 23, I'm sorry, 22 through 25. And it tells us there's a responsibility there for us too. It says, wives, submit, your, uh, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. And it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is the subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I'm going to put a picture up here that I hope you guys don't get offended with. And at the time, it's my two dogs. I got three now. This is Max and this is Cookie. We got another dog. His name is Temp for temporary because we thought he was going to be temporary. <laughs> He's not. <laughs> but these three dogs, we do a lot of things for them. And I know I'm not the only one, Shannon and Nathan, with Marlo. But you think about how much we care for our dogs. We'll make sure that they get their shots. We'll make sure they'll get their tags. We'll make sure that when they stink, they get a bath. And, and even if their breast stinks, we'll find something there at PetSmart to get rid of that too. We'll make sure they, they are fed. We'll make sure that they go out and use the bathroom. You think about how much attention that we give to our pets. Once again, I'm not condemning pets either. But you think about the undivided attention that we give to these animals. And Max, he's a jerk because he gets all the attention in my house. He gets better attention than I do. Because that dog gets his dog robbed, he gets fed, you know, all he has to do is like kind of whimper. He used to flip the bowl, but he doesn't do that anymore because we made a thing to where he wouldn't do that. But these dogs get the greatest attention here at our house. And I don't want you to start neglecting your animals, but I want you to think about how you can be a little bit better with our brethren compared to your dog or your cat. Or we even had a gerbil named Gene Simmons, or a hamster. I love that thing, that it carrots. But you think about how much attention we pay to these things and how much we value these things. And when it comes to a brother in Christ, it should be something a little bit stronger, don't you think? I do love my brother more than these dogs. <laughs> but that should be something that's... Be no problem for us to do. You know, ever since my friend passed away, I'm not afraid to tell my brethren I love them. And we talked about Bill Farrell. And Bill's a very dear friend of mine. And if you're listening, Bill, tell Paula I said hi. But I remember when his mom passed away, I wanted him to know that I loved him. Sometimes we don't get those opportunities to say that one more time. And there is a lot of great people here. And it's pretty encouraging when I look across this audience. It feels like I don't have a stranger here tonight. And that's pretty awesome. But don't be afraid to tell each other that you love each other. And it doesn't, you know, take a notch down your manhood. It doesn't make you feel like the, that you don't love your wife less or love your children less or love your animals less, but you want them to know how important they are. And we need brethren and we need each other because we are going through some challenges like never before. We've seen bitterness kind of really creep in everything. We've seen negativity kind of come in at a rapid fire pace. Let's not neglect one another. Time is too short for that. And before you know it, they're gone. May I encourage you to take the opportunity to give time to one another. The one thing that we find with this talent of this particular individual, he neglected a gift they had, 
or I would say gifts. And he didn't take the opportunity to do anything that was profitable. That's why he's considered wicked. We could say it's easy to call him lazy, but there's a reason why he is considered wicked. It's because he doesn't care about anyone. And God reminds us, and God gives us too many examples about how we need to care for one another. Finally, don't be afraid to fail. Brethren, we will always have failure. There's going to be people that come into our lives that we'll think the world of and we'll ask ourselves, why do they fall away? And then we struggle with that. I had one guy that was a very seasoned preacher, and, and we, got, we got the opportunity to meet him a couple months ago. And uh, I don't want to say his name just because uh, I didn't realize he was going through a struggle. And it wasn't anybody here. But this individual was having a Bible study one time where a brother in Christ publicly told him he was a false teacher. And after that Bible study, he sat down with his wife and he leaned over to his wife and he says, I'm not coming up to preach. He says, you got to, you're the preacher. He goes, no, I don't. This is not a guy that's been doing it for five or 10 or, or he's been doing it twice as long as I have <laughs> that said this. And when things like that happen, we don't know how to go the next step. When some brother has come to us said something that has hurt us and we feel like we have failed in this relationship, we don't know what to do and we think that the only option that we have is don't come back. <laughs> or we have someone that's come forward and we think the world of that has converted themselves into a life of Christ and you've spent an exhaustively long time trying to get them to come and convert and you got them there and you got them baptized and there's a great celebration and then the next thing you know, you never see them again. And you say to yourself, all the time I've spent because I was worried for this individual's soul and now they're gone. I feel like I, I can't go through this again. Or you try to convert some, or I'll, I'll tell you something personal that happened to me was I had an individual that I was worried about in the marriage that she was getting into because he was he was very adamant that they was not going to be a part of this congregation. And I gave a sermon. I can remember preaching this sermon. I was very young at the time. I remember when I said this, it was like I was talking to you, Mr. Cohen. I was looking right at your eyes when I was telling you this. And afterwards, she said, great sermon. She still married him. Ten years later, she's no longer a part of the church. And we were close. And I couldn't understand why. And you ask yourself, why? Why keep on doing this? You know, I officiate five sports. And if you know anything about refs or umpires, or, or it's not fun <laughs> sometimes. And you probably ask yourself, why would you do that on a regular basis? And you know that you're going to hear something bad and you know that you're going to be told that you're just something less. And I say the same thing every time, because for the five bad games that I'll have with bad games, <laughs> I'll find something really good out of one. I'll see a kid catch a touchdown with a football to his helmet walking in the end zone, and I'll be happy to recall that a touchdown. I'll see a girl that I don't think could hit a home run and I'm behind home plate and when she hits that, it's gone. And you could tell, not because you could see it, because you could hear it. Is that right, Mr. Kazmersky? Or you see some kid do a bicycle kick in soccer. That's pretty impressive. That's why you do it. 
because you see something really cool that makes you love the sport that you officiate. And I tell you that to tell you this. There's going to be some times you're going to really have some heartache. And there's going to be some times where you're going to really get upset. And sometimes you're going to go home and you're going to cry about it. And you're going to find out that some of your brethren may not act like brethren. And you're going to ask yourself, why even bother? Why be an elder? Why be a preacher? Why be a member of a church? Because there is going to be one thing that you find in there that makes everything fantastic. Maybe it's the little girl that comes up to you and hugs you, but doesn't hug your wife. Maybe it's someone that comes up and shakes your hand and says, I appreciate you. Maybe it's somebody that hugs you. Take time to look at the holy kiss. I just did a sermon on the holy kiss. Take time to see how many times the holy kiss is used in the Bible. And I'm telling you to start having a smooch fest. But I'm telling you is there's a reason why that gesture is something that the Apostle Paul and Peter and examples that we see by Jesus Christ have been practiced. And it's because of the relationship and how unique that relationship is with your brethren. There's going to be times when there's failure. But don't let the failure overcome you. Paul says, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, and most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in the infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, I am strong. There was a brother in Christ one time when he was asked, what well, is the hardest thing that he ever had to do as a pastor? And what he, he, scripturally he was. He was, an, he was a preacher, but he was also an elder. He said, what was the hardest thing you ever had to do as a pastor? He said, the next thing. And the reason being is because he had to deal with all the other things before, and they conquered, and they won. He doesn't know what's going to lie ahead. Brethren, there's going to be things that's going to happen that is beyond our control. But don't be the individual that is afraid to do something because they're afraid they're going to fail. We see it in all times in athletes. We see it all times in musicians and authors. You know, one of my favorite authors, he didn't start writing books until he was around the age of 50 because he was failing to write or he was a movie producer or a movie writer and he wasn't doing well with writing movies. So he started writing books. His name is Lee Child. He wrote Jack Reacher. He's still writing books now. He's getting ready to retire. But there was a time where he thought he wasn't going to be able to make it. So he better start doing something. I took my wife to Detroit. My wife is a big fan of Little Caesar's Pizza. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> but the one thing I tried to show her when I was at Detroit, because I, I, I love baseball, I took her to a Tigers game. And I said, I want you to look around the Tiger Stadium, and I want you to see all the Little Caesar stuff that's around here. And the reason being is because the owner of Little Caesars also owned the Detroit Tigers. He also owned the Pistons. He also owned the Red Wings. He started business because he wanted to be a baseball player. He blew out his knee playing baseball, and they told him, he says, well, you're not going to sit around home doing nothing. So he started making pizza. And instead of playing baseball, he became an owner of baseball. But there's failure involved in that. Sometimes we got to just sit back and ask ourselves, what do we need to do to change? Look there in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 through 19. The Hebrew writer says, There are two mutable things in which it's possible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon us 
the hope that is set before us, which hope we has as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which we enter into that within the veil. And what he's telling us about is going into the temple. And it's not the temple anymore, like we read back in the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. It's not the temple that we talk about when we look at uh, Nahum and where they tried to rebuild a temple. He is talking about being able to go into the kingdom of heaven. That is for you. There is a reward that is given to you that I think we don't really fully fathom how great it is. Revelation tells us about this. There is a day that's going to come when there's no pain. And I've dealt with pain just like all you have at one time or another. If I sit down too long, it's tired, hard, and I got to limp around until I get really moving again. And I take medicine for that. There's going to be a day when I don't have to take medicine anymore. You think about the things that we see on the news that disturbs us, the hurricane that just went through Florida. You hear about the Indonesia soccer match that killed 124 people in the stampede. You think about the numbers that we read about in COVID that has taken many lives from us, and they took lives from me too. I took a friend of mine, and I had to do his funeral. They used to ride truck with me at Lowe's. You think about that suffering that people will go through, and we are told that there's not going to be that suffering anymore. And you think about the times that you have cried and the tears you have shed. And I've shed my fair share of tears this year too. And I'm told that there's going to be a time when I don't have to do that anymore. Is that not something that you want? Do you not want a place that has no pain, no suffering, no tears, no evil? You know, when I look at this parable and I think about this parable a lot, I I put this plot up here for a reason because when we read about those things in this particular parable, we think this is about someone's whole life journey from the time the individual's born to the time the individual dies. We think that this is just the, the whole the whole bowl of wax of what this individual has done. And therefore, that's why he's either going to go into this uh, this place of paradise or he is going to go to this place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. But remember what this servant or this master tells his servant of the one that has that five talents. You have done well with many things and I will put you in charge of many things. It's not talking about his whole life's work. It's talking about how great of what he is doing right now. He's not trying to tally up all the things he has done and therefore here here is the conclusion of the matter. He is telling you, I am happy with what you're doing now. Take the opportunity, brethren, to live in the now. Take the opportunity to do something. Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't procrastinate. Don't wait till uh, you're able to, uh, to able to get out. You know, I don't know about you, but it's been pretty encouraging to go to some of the places that I go to now, and there's people there, except for Pittsburgh Pirates. <laughs> but it's encouraging to go to certain things and certain events, and people are there to celebrate with you. And how great is it that we have an opportunity tonight at 7.30, we're going on here, that we come here and we can worship God because some people do not have that luxury. What can I do to help you do what you need to do that is so urgent to do now? 
Maybe the step you need to take is baptism in Christ. And maybe that's the next step you need to take. Let's do it tonight. Let's not wait till the end of the week. Let's not wait till, till mom and dad's here. Let's not wait till some kind of this fantastic moment. The fantastic moment is right before us. Don't wait when it comes to repentance and you need to repent of sin and, and, and take the opportunity to well, just wait till like the crowd dies down. Maybe there won't be enough people to sit here and question why I came forward. Don't think about that. The time to do that is now. When I, the last time I came forward, it was at Marietta Reno. And I did. I lived a life of hypocrisy for a couple years. And I struggled with it. And just when my grandmother passed away, I just said to myself, you know, I just need to make a better change here. I need to work on some things. And, and uh, Tim Fleeman was the one preaching that morning. And, and I went up front and, and he sat there and says, what's going on? And I said, well, I said, I said, I just don't want to be a hypocrite anymore. He says, well, well tell him that. <laughs> I said, okay. And from that point on is where I started working. I didn't wait for another day. And trust me, the, the work wasn't easy because I had to change a lot of things in my life. Now I also had to worry about people going to think of me different. And that's been a blessing too. But repentance in a public way should not be something that you feel that you need to be ashamed of. That should be encouraging to us because that should show our audience that you're not afraid of ridicule. You are concerned about your soul's condition. And also, it should be a great example to us to say, if she or he is not afraid to do this, why should I? Maybe you need to pray tonight. There's a lot to pray for. I think of all of us were surprised with our brother that had this detached retina and you think surgery would be the thing that would solve the problem, but here it's going to take removing his eye. And we need to pray for him because it's going to change for him. And he does not only need our prayers, but he needs us. But right now we have an opportunity to pray for him. Let's take that opportunity while we have it right before us. But whatever your needs are, let's do it right here, right now. Won't you come while we stand, while we sing?